so you, uh, how many people are living down there currently? Like, you know, depends on the field season. So the seasons are reversed. Yeah. So the the field season is in our winter. So okay. November, December, January, February, March. Um, South Pole has a contingent of people that overwinter there that's a pretty small crew. And then there's a lot more that come in for research in the summer. McMurdo has permanent staff that's there. And some of the other bases around the world, different countries have different bases that will be staffed. Permanent staff. But it's, you know, some of them are seasonal, some of them okay. aren't. And I would say in the off season, you probably have a few hundred on the entire continent. So this is wow. a continent the size of one and a half mm -hmm. you know, continental United States is. And you think about only a few hundred people being there, and then the the, the prime of the year probably a few thousand. Mm -hmm. And and so so you said in the winter is usually so how many uh, expeditions are going out this year? That if would, any? Well, that's because <laughs> well, I know with the pandemic yeah. they're they're probably putting a lot of blocks on that. Yeah. But like, so COVID's disrupted stuff. So that'd be something you'd have to check with Scar on because yeah. there's this international coordination. A lot of the U.S. expeditions have been disrupted, so they've been trying to since it's the second year of a disruption deal with critical systems so stuff that's atmospheric sciences and meteorology or astronomy but there's a lot of other equipment in that that has not been serviced or had the data taken out of it and we're going into our just our second year of disruptions um so covid's not been good especially for a lot of researchers that are new to the field um i'm i have an article that i uh that i found from 2016 and talking about Antarctica, I'm just going to briefly uh, mention it, but uh, just kind of, what do you guys know about the, uh, about the Wilkes Land uh, uh, meteor, uh, I'm sorry, gravity, the gravity anomaly in Wilkes, in Wilkes Land, like, it, have you heard about that? Where they had like, you know, basically these satellites up in, up in, up in space and they were, you know, measuring the Earth's gravity poles because throughout, you know. Uh, the planet basically because you know gravity varies depending on your elevation and whatnot so you know they basically found this uh you know giant mass of about like 300 miles of you know this strong gravitational pull in the south pole and, and i was wondering like since then what kind of research we've done on that because i know it was uh, one of the guys one of the scientists uh that was a part of that was from ohio state uh what's his name uh had it written? It's in this article. I'm trying to find it, but yeah, Ralph von Fries is his name. Yeah. So what, what? What? How come we haven't really heard much about that since yeah, 2006? So I, well, I, I think people may not be aware. Uh, gravimetric studies have been used for a long time to try to figure out what's beneath the Earth's surface. Right. So if you think about, we have a planet. We all in middle school learned a little about the structure of it. And you might say, well, nobody's been there. How do you really know what it looks like? So earthquakes and the waves given off by them are one way we can do it, but also these gravimetric studies to figure out what is the depth of the continent and yeah. what's it look like beneath the and surface. especially that's important with Antarctica. Yeah, so a lot of it is giving us a sense of what's, what is happening beneath the surface. We also use it, we have satellites now that are not just you walking on the surface and taking these measurements, but flying over the Earth's surface. And we use it even to figure out where's water distributed. Mm -hmm. So there's the GRACE satellites, which are two satellites, and the distance between them uh, as they fly over a location helps us figure out how much water is beneath the surface in places like California. So it's just a technique that's used to allow us to peer beneath and see where's the water distributed, how deep is the continent, or what rock is the continent made of. Yeah. And and so like with that, like have, have, has any research on that in particular that you guys know of, like has that expanded at all or is it just like did it end up just being nothing at all or I don't know? Well, I think it's ongoing and, and part of the important the reason it's relevant right now right. is we really want to know what's what's it look like beneath the earth mm -hmm. beneath the surface of the ice so how deep is the continent if that ice is removed is the continent going to be above sea level or below right. sea level and then what does that mean for sea level rise and how it's going to affect the coast around the rest of the world mm -hmm. so you know techniques like this and using radar to penetrate through the ice and, and see what that looks like gives us a better sense of how much is the ocean going to rise as we lose a lot of this ice in antarctica okay uh, so yeah not much on the uh, on the gravity side, but more it's, it's just it's, it's just more weird. yeah. It's like it's one of those things where you use different methods to get a clear idea of what it looks like, and this yeah. is one of the methods that's used. But it goes back a long time. I think if you all the way go back to Humboldt, who's exploring South America in the 1700s, yeah. he was using similar techniques, barometric pressure and gravimetric. So this is not a new method, but it's a method we get better at using using with time, right? And and more accurate, but it it helps us see part of the puzzle um yeah here we go i got here's a question i had uh what are the most commonly used methods for drilling into polar ice and glaciers 
Yeah, so the Bird Center probably is a bit more known for our ice cores that are drilled in mountains. Uh, but ice cores are also drilled in Antarctica and Greenland, our, our two ice caps right. that are left. Um, the old school way and the way you can go out and do it if you're sampling to plan for an expedition is you can use a hand auger, which I've watched people do and is very time consuming and draining where you actually use a big bore and you spin it and yeah. corkscrew your way into the ice and then pull this ice up, usually a meter at a time. So you take a meter out, you drop that drill back in, drill down another meter, pull One that out. One meter at a time? Meter a yard at a time. Wow. Now, some of our teams have claimed they've been able to get, I think, 36 feet doing that. <laughs> um, I can tell you it looks a lot more grueling as you get deeper oh, yeah, and deeper. I can imagine. So the, the campaigns that go out to get... You know, while drilling and doing these kind of expeditions, have we found anything like frozen in the ice, like maybe vegetation or, you know, maybe even animals? I don't know. <laughs> like anything that's been like frozen in time that would lead you to believe that there maybe was life on Antarctica at some point in our Earth's history? Yeah, there's um, you can find a lot of things. So, I mean, there's microscopic stuff. There's pollen. There's viruses. Uh, we have a big mm -hmm. project. Going yeah, right I, look I at think viruses. I saw something yeah. about that. Yeah. Um, you can find larger things sometimes, not in Antarctica so much, but some of our teams have found leaves that get blown up in storms in the Amazon. that get deposited in the Andes and those will get preserved in the ice. Um, insects, sometimes they get preserved. And those are great because they let you carbon date stuff. Right. So they give you dating techniques. There's maybe the biggest example is the Utsi Man, which was discovered in Europe in the mid 90s, I think. Mm -hmm. And this is somebody who had, they were run over by the glacier, so they died. Their body was there, probably desiccated. And then as snows fell, the snows, either they got run over by the glacier or the snows grew over top of them. And this body was preserved and then it melted out thousands of years later yeah it was kind of like uh i know i don't even know if this was true but i remember hearing like in the news that there was like this you know uh the uh, what do you call it mammoth i guess that they had found i don't even know if they found that in, in antarctica but i know that they found that somewhere and they were trying to clone it or thaw it out or whatever i don't know i, I don't even know if that's still happening or not i don't know if it was glacier ice but you do f the permafrost is changing dramatically in the arctic mm -hmm. and a lot of things that got buried in permafrost froze in the ground mm -hmm. and so as the as that permafrost melts back we are finding stuff like mammoths um and then in fact there was an example in the poster the dispatch today about a about a, a mammoth tusk that they're using and they can plot the place that this mammoth went in its life and in, in the arctic using that because it wasn't wasn't lithified it didn't become rock it just dried out and it's still the right. tusk itself oh so yeah it's fully preserved yeah so we are getting the chance unfortunately because of all the permafrost that's melting to study a lot of stuff in the arctic we wouldn't have otherwise right and I mean, I think with that, it kind of opens up, it's kind of opening up opportunity too, like, cause like, you know, it's, it's almost making the mystery start to go away, like naturally, but like, yeah, I mean, there's definitely negative effects, but, uh, with that, I mean, uh, my, I guess my question is, is what, when was Antarctica like, when did, what, like, when was it fully frozen like this? Was it because of the ice age or was it before that? Um, I mean, I guess. Yeah, so a few things to think about. One is it used to be closer to the equator, so it was closer to India. And plate tectonics, it moved into its current arrangement over the last hmm. few million years, tens of millions of years. And so that's meant that the, the climate it experienced is different. We also have the CO2 levels in the atmosphere that have changed. Yeah, they fluctuate like crazy. Yeah. yeah, and so you know you had a time period that both due to that, but also due to its arrangement on the, on the globe, it went into much colder conditions. And, and in fact, this kind of puzzled some of the early British explorers, although it made sense, they just chalked it up to the climate changes, they would find these, these remnants of tree ferns, these lithified rock uh, stumps that were the remnants of old trees that had been there. And they just would look around and go, well, there's really not any <laughs> plant life here now. There's yeah. mosses and lichens, but there's these big tree stumps that are preserved that we found elsewhere in the world. That must have meant the climate was different. Now, this yeah. is long before plate tectonics, right. so they couldn't fill in the rest of the picture but they knew the climate couldn't have always been the same. And you also find things like um, these ammonites that are, are marine species that are extinct, mm -hmm. and you don't find those except for warm tropical waters. So they knew that this place wasn't always the cold environment that it was when they were exploring. Yeah, and I, I bet beneath the ice, like we'll find, you know, through time, more and more evidence of that, you know, being the case. Because like, I know they found like the frozen, like, you know, tree, uh, 